really honored to be joined by our next guest here. He's a two-time WWF Tag Team Champion, two-time Intercontinental Champion, oh, and a WWE Hall of Famer, truly a legend of the squared circle, Mr. Tito Santana. Tito, thank you so much for joining us. This is so exciting. Thank you for having me. I'll start well, off here. Um, you know, we, we do a podcast about wrestling cards and collectibles and stuff like that. And the increased popularity of wrestling cards lately, I was wondering, like, when you do signings and stuff, if you're getting more people that are bringing actual trading cards for you to sign, like, other than just photos and stuff? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there are uh, quite a few, uh, you know, people that have... Uh, I guess is is this uh, my rookie year? Or? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was that was going to be my next question. I was going to ask you, what's your most popular card you sign? Is it usually your wrestling all stars rookie card? Yeah, this is this is the one. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, but but uh, you know, who would have thought that the cards were were going to be more more uh, popular than than just the eight by tens even? Right. Right. It's kind of and, 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 pretty and neat. It, yeah, it's kind of interesting because in the hobby, we're actually starting to see a resurgence in eight by tens. Um, people are now starting to gravitate to those, also. Uh -huh. um, so I think that's pretty that's pretty interesting. With 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 the demand for your signature, um, do you notice more now with say Pernini than Tops as far as the number of autographs they're wanting you to do? Uh, I don't understand the question. With uh, the card companies, the actual card companies that send you like the stickers and stuff to sign for the cards that go into their product now are you having to do you know have you noticed that you have to sign more of that stuff for the companies or is it about the same as it's always been uh it's i would say it's the same okay hey i wanted to, i wanted to ask you um uh, doing a little bit of research, um, I see you played at West Texas A&M University for football when you were younger, back at, back in your college days. Um, I wanted to ask you, how did that prepare you for a uh, future career in wrestling? Um, was it the was it something that um, um, really trained you well for a future in wrestling? Well, I just think that uh, when I got into wrestling. I, I didn't know anything about wrestling. I wasn't a wrestling fan. So uh, I, I I think a lot of the guys, you know, Terry Funk and, and you know, Tully Blanchard and Joe Blanchard and uh, those guys, they just had respect for me because I was an athlete, you know. And, and uh, when I trained with Hiro Matsuda, the fact that I was a, an athlete, you know, I could hold my own pretty good. So... I, I think I, I you know because wrestling is not easy you know uh, right especially the beginning when you when you're getting used to it's different conditioning you know and and that's what they try to do is they try to wear your ass out and <laughs> you know the <laughs> fact that I you know was used to pushing myself you know that 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 uh, that helped me you know but uh, the conditioning you know, there's there's so much to wrestling, you know, the psychology, the the the, the ring management uh, with, with your opponent, and you know, there's a lot more than meets the eye. That uh, I found it very difficult. You know, uh, it was a very slow process for me to to, to grasp, you know, and, and become, you know, the worker that I became. But the reason I became as good as I did was because I had a lot of help. Like every night that I was working. I was going against guys that were better than me that were teaching me all the time. And, you know, it's a, uh, it's an art without a doubt. And, and full never learn how to work. Yeah. <laughs> you can see that. Yeah. Okay. If full disclosure here, I was a huge magnificent Morocco fan when I was a kid. So when you beat him for the intercontinental title, it, it really just ripped my heart out. But I was I, I saw an interview you did online. I was wondering if you could share the story of the green title belt that you know you beat uh, Greg Valentine for in the cage match in 1985 and then he demolished the belt afterward. Yeah, I heard, yeah. heard a great story that you had on that and yeah, you know yeah. a lot of our people that watch this they love 
wrestling memorabilia and stuff. So I think this would be a great story if you'd be willing to share that with them. You want to see me cry, right? That's what you want to do. <laughs> well, I, I feel for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, who, who would have thought that wrestling was going to get as big as it, as it, as it has. Yeah. So Greg beat up the belt in, in the cage match. I was the champion. I walked away from the arena with the belt. I brought it home. It was all off the leather. The you know the the, the 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 metal was bent. It was it was pretty beat up. So I took it home and I I had it laying and I have a gym in my house and I had it laying in my gym and you know it sat there probably for about ten years and I just got wow. tired of looking at it and I picked it up and I <laughs> threw it in the freaking garbage. Wow! And you know that that belt would probably be worth thousands of dollars right yes. now absolutely that's a gr like when i watched that interview where i saw you talk about that when you got to the part where you said throw it out i was like no don't say you threw it out and you oh said it and i was just God. like oh I wish I, knew what, I, I wish I knew what the place it ended up i'd go yeah. dig it up right now. Has, has mr valentine ever commented back to you uh years later about that belt or anything like that well i told him you know and and, and he says, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, everybody everybody has the same response, you know, because, uh, you know, as it turned out, I mean, who would have thought that, you know, people were going to be giving you three, five thousand dollars for a pair of wrestling old boots, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. nobody would have get none of us would have guessed, you know, what what everything has turned into. Yeah, Hulk, Hulk Hogan just had a pair of boots sell last week uh, for $66,000, believe it or not. Ain't that Man. something? Yep. Hey, I was going to I was going to ask you um you 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 are a lot of people might not realize it, but um the history of WrestleMania and how it's become such a big event every year, you actually were the very first match ever for WrestleMania. Have you ever thought about what the legacy it, it was and, and, and how important it was that you got to perform in the very first match ever for WrestleMania? Well, it, it, it didn't uh, really settle with me uh, uh, the importance of being the first match. Uh, WrestleMania 1, uh, Greg Valentine and I had the hottest feud in the WWF. Mm -hmm. We were selling out big arenas without Hogan being on the card. Uh all over the country, you know, our, 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 our feud got over with the fans because, you know, we were both good workers and the people mm -hmm. really bought into, you know, the, the whole uh, surgery on my knee and, and everything. So uh, I was pretty upset that I was the opening match, you know, WrestleMania yeah. one. And uh, I, I'm in right behind the curtain in, in Madison square garden, ready to go out. And Vince McMahon, I guess, Vince McMahon is the best worker of all of us. He waited right before I went out to the curtain and he says, uh, Tito, the reason you are the first match is because we need to get the people off their ass and you're going to set the tempo. And that gave me a completely different outlook when I went yeah. through the curtains. And I realized, you know, he gave me a big pat on the, on the shoulder, you know, that uh, he considered me one of the best workers in the territory and you know he knew that i was over with the fans and you know i i set a good tempo for the for the night that was against the executioner right was that buddy rose yes <laughs> buddy yeah. rose playboy buddy rose i remember him playboy buddy oh. rose he didn't want anybody to see his face <laughs> he didn't want to do a job <laughs> now did your whole you, you worked as a baby face your whole career did yeah. you ever work as a heel ever anywhere? No, I, I, I tried to, uh, when Rick Martel, Strike Force, when we split up and Rick was gone for a year and then they told me that he was going to be coming back, uh, I didn't know that he already had the model gimmick all worked out and stuff. Mm -hmm. I said, Vince, you know, can I be the, the heel? I, I'd like to, because I thought I was, I thought I had a pretty good grasp of, of the business and I had seen baby faces other baby faces who I didn't think were as good a worker as I was and good at the ring psychology that I had. 
and, and they had made the transition from a baby face to a heel, I, I figured I could do it. And, and I could, I was a good worker and I could lead a match and, you know, and I could, I could be a good heel. But Vince said, uh, no, he says, uh, I, I got a lot of good stuff planned for you as a baby face still, but never, never got a chance to be a heel. That's incredible. Anthony? Um, I was going to, I wanted to ask you, um, one of the, uh, probably, organizations that has a lot of fans that love it back in the day was ECW. I know you were in ECW for a while. What was your experience with ECW and ECW uh, heavyweight champion? I believe. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and what stories could you tell us about that? Well, to, to be honest with you, uh, I, I was only uh, ECW just at one night. Oh, okay. I thought oh, it was wow. longer than that. I came in, I came in uh, for the tournament and I moved up the ladder, and I, I ended up meeting Don Morocco at the at the end, and I beat Don Morocco. Uh, at the time, I didn't think ECW was was a very reputable uh, organization. You know, I came back from the WWE, where the baby faces were in one dressing room and the heels were in another dressing room. You didn't see kids, you didn't see wives. And all of a sudden, uh, when I went to the ECW, I saw wives and girlfriends hanging around in the locker room. You didn't even, even have a place to to dress. Uh, so I, I did win the belt, uh, and I was the world champion. And uh, I just never planned to go back, and I never went back, uh, you know, for to do anything with them. Looking back in your career, who would you say was uh... – Probably the top three guys that you enjoyed working with the most. Well, without a doubt, uh, you know, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. I, mm. I loved working with that guy. He was a hard worker, and, and we had great chemistry in the ring. Uh, I was working with him in, in L.A., and, you know, it doesn't happen too much where, where, where a fan jumps in the ring to, to help the baby face. And the fans jumped, you know, Paul was working on me and, and I was selling and a fan jumped on his back and, you know, Paul <laughs> just threw, flipped him over and started putting the boots to the guy. And, you know, the guy left the ring, but he was, he was my number one guy to work. You know, the, if I was to pick a guy that I wanted to work with, I, I, I loved working with the, of course, Greg Valentine. I mean, mm. we, we had great chemistry together. We, we had the longest feud in the history of the WWE, and uh, my my uh, third choice would be you know a guy that I, I considered one of the best minds in, in the business, uh, Jake the Snake. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Was a good, great guy to work with. Great heel, great leader. I yeah, we talked a little bit about you playing football in college and stuff. I know you played in the CFL. You tried out for the Kansas City Chiefs, correct? Yeah, I went I, I went I went into the Chiefs. I I, I was in the best shape of my life and, and two weeks before I had to report for camp, I, I uh, twisted my my ankle. I you know, I was running uh, best patterns. Mm. I was running passes and and uh, I messed up my Achilles tendon and I, I, the, the the trainer who happened to be there for in college, and he sent me right to the doctor, and they gave me a cortisone shot. I was in crutches for a week. Hmm. Second week, they gave me another cortisone shot. I was able to walk on it. And the day before I left for camp, they gave me another cortisone shot. And when I got to, I got there on a Sunday morning. They timed this Sunday afternoon. I told the trainer to uh, really. Uh, tape my ankle up really solid because I didn't want to let him know that I had injured my my ankle mm -hmm. and my my time in the 40 was not good at all mm -hmm. and I was there for 10 weeks I mean I started uh, every preseason game they they had a number one draft pick from Kentucky that they they uh, he never got to play in any of the preseason games they, they traded him to New York and then New York it just uh, everything's a work, right? They traded him in New York, and then New York got rid of him. That way, Kansas City wouldn't look bad uh, <laughs> with their pick. Mm -hmm. But I believe that if, if I had uh, 
I had ran because I, I could run a four eight once in a while. I'd dip into a four seven something. Uh, I ended up running like a five one mm. and the forty. And and, and the, when the head coach talked to me, he says, "You're a hell of an athlete, but you're too slow." I never told the coaches, you know, what happened to me. Yeah. Uh, but by the time, because I was there for, uh, I think I was there for ten weeks total. Wow. Uh, and by the time uh, I, I was healed, by the time you know, I, I should have asked him to tie me in the forty again. But I, I it, it never. I, I started every preseason game, so I figured, you know, I'm doing okay. You know, mm -hmm. all the other guys, yeah. all the other veterans, you know, would tell me that I was going to make it. I was going to make it. I was going to make it. But they had the, the 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 time. They had me as a slow, you know, slow guy, and they killed that 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 killed me. They after I went to to, to Canada after. The, the the season was over. Kansas City called me back. They wanted me to go back again the next year, but I, I said, no, I, I was going back to, to the BC Lions again. And I mean, I was the only tight end there, so I didn't have much competition there. Was it a tough decision to give up football to start training to be a wrestler? No, no, it wasn't a it wasn't a tough decision because uh I I knew that the the football player's career was was not very long. Yeah. And uh, I, I saw where wrestlers, you know, were in their late 30s, early 40s, and, and they were in their prime. And, you know, I figured I'd have a much longer career in, in wrestling. I mean, I had no idea that my career was going to move as quick as it did. Uh, so... I never would have made the kind of money in football that I did in, in wrestling. So it, it was a good move for me. It was a great move for all of us to get to see you yeah. and be a wrestler. Absolutely. Now, now at your college alma mater, um, the, the names of Tolly Blanchard, Ted DiBiase, Dorian Terry Funk, Bobby Duncan, Bruiser Brody, Stan Hansen, Dusty Rhodes, all went to that school that you played football at. When you went, when you entered wrestling, did that come back to help you? I mean, did they kind of look at you like, hey, you were one of us from, from uh, football days? Did those guys look out for you and help you from that standpoint? Uh, I, I believe, like, I, I had met Terry Funk. He, he would hang out and, you know, football practice and, uh, and talk to me. I, I had met Terry Funk. Uh, and Stan Hansen was my freshman. He was a tight end coach my freshman year. In nice. <laughs> at West Texas State, so I had a relationship with him. And of course, Tully and DiBiase, uh, Manny Fernandez, uh, Bruiser Brody. On the other hand, I, I, I couldn't figure him out. I, I didn't know Bruiser Brody, and I worked with Bruiser Brody in Chicago, and uh, he wasn't going to beat me. I was going to get my arm raised in Chicago because there was a lot of Mexicans there. And we're we're just circling in the ring, and uh, for some reason he says, uh, uh, "It's amazing how we're in the same match, and we're not going to get paid the same." <coughs> and I said to myself, I, "I didn't say anything to him, but I said to myself, the fuck is this, the hell is he want to tell me this for?'" Right. Forgive me for the word. But no, no, that's fine. Myself, I said, uh, I don't need to know, you know, I'm just getting started in my career. I was young in my career. I was with, with the AWA when I wrestled him in Chicago. I said, I know that you've been around longer than me. You know, I yeah. know in, in wrestling, we all we all had our peck in order, you know. Mm -hmm. Hulk Hogan was the top, and we, we knew where we belonged. We all wanted to get to the top. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you, you don't need to rub it in, you know, and – I, I just don't think he was very happy that he that 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 uh, he had to put me over. Wow! Yeah, wow. What would you? What do you consider like the highlight of your career? I know it's probably difficult with a career that long, but like, doesn't have to be the highlight, but one of the highlights of your career. Well, the highlight of my, of my career, you know, I came from uh, Mission, Texas, which population was 14,000 people. Uh, and the first time that I stepped into a 
Madison Square Garden, uh, you know, that was an amazing feeling when I, when I, you know, just walked in and looked around and saw 20,000 wow. plus people, you know, the, the play, you know, I started in, in Florida. Well, I, I actually uh, refereed a few matches in Texas for Joe Blanchard. I started out as a referee before I even went into the ring to train. And then I went to Florida and, you know, th they were drawing good crowds, but you know, the biggest arena that they went to was maybe seven, 8,000 people. And I, I hadn't wrestled anywhere where there was more than 10,000 people anywhere or near, near 10,000. And then I get to uh, Medicine Square Garden and I see 20,000 people there, and you know, and, and, and the people in, in Medicine Square Garden fans, you know, you just didn't step in and all of a sudden <laughs> people start cheering for you. Yeah, You had to earn, you had to earn, you know, you had to earn uh, the fans backing, you know, and it, it was hard work. It, it took a while, but uh, eventually I got over with the fans in New York. Big time. I asked, I asked Sting a question a few years ago down in Kansas City, and I want to ask you the same question. Um, was there ever a time during your wrestling career where you felt your safety could be in jeopardy because the crowd or the fans got so raucous outside the uh, outside the ring and there and 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 you guys worried about your safety within the ring itself? Not not within the ring itself, but uh, coming into the arena, I remember it, it was in Madison Square Garden again. Uh, me and Junkyard Dog. Uh, and Sergeant Slaughter were, were in, a, in Sergeant Slaughter's uh, limo and, and the fans were out there and they were rocking, you know, I, I thought they were going to flip the car <laughs> over, you know, the fans. And they were hollering our names, you know, they, they were they were fans, but, you know, uh, yeah. they, they weren't there to be. We, I think the heels could, could have been in trouble, but uh, the baby face, you know, we were all baby faces and uh, they, they – they just wanted to, I guess, touch the car that we were in, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, anything can happen in New York. <laughs> but in the ring, I never felt, I never felt, you know, there, there was always, you know, good security. Uh, the time that uh, the fan came into the ring uh, in, in L.A., Mr. Wonderful took care of that fan, so I didn't have to worry. I was, I kept selling, <laughs> you know. I kept was, selling it, was, what, what, was, was there a really bad decision jumping on Paul Orndorff's back? <laughs> was, was there a particular arena that you like performing in the most? Uh, I love uh, San Diego. Okay. San Diego wasn't the, the biggest arena around, uh, not even compared to L.A., uh, but uh, the acoustics, the, I mean, the fans, you know, the, 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 it was as loud or louder than, than Madison Square Garden, you know. Wow. Because it was, a, wow. you know, the acoustics were, were different. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a different tone, and, and it was, and the fans were fantastic there. Do you follow now, any wrestling nowadays? No, I, 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 I did an appearance with the, uh, and I can't remember his name, the guy that brought me in in, in Jersey. Uh, Wirt, Wirt, Bruce, is it Bruce Wirt? Brought me in and he booked me, but I didn't know that I was going to a wrestling match. And <laughs> it turned out to be, it was a, a WWE wrestling match, live match. That's when uh, they, they introduced Cody Rhodes. Mm. Oh wow! The night of Cody Rhodes, mm -hmm. yeah, and and uh, I was watching the matches, and and pretty much everybody that came out maybe weighed between 190 and 200 pounds, you know, yeah. and it's like the 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 wrestlers are a different breed, you know, and of course they don't have the psychology that that we had, and and I don't think the psychology is important anymore in in, in wrestling. They just go in there and beat the crap out of each other for no rhyme or reason. Yeah. I agree with you on that. Like, I don't know what I, I'm old. So, you know, when I'm watching as a kid, like just that feeling that I used to get watching wrestling. And I feel like, like the fans don't 
get that now like like they act like well everybody knows it's not real it's like yeah but like you want to believe it that's the right. difference like i want to believe it's real like i i want to totally buy what they're selling me and like it's not just about flipping around and stuff i like feeling the emotion of that person made me mad because he did this to my favorite and and i just, think I think in my era, you know, the, the, in, in our era and, and before, uh, there was a lot of fans who would be willing to fight you, you know, if, if, if you said that it was fake, you know. Yeah, there, oh, there yeah, a lot, absolutely. A lot of fans yep. really believed it, it was in the up and up, you know, because, you know, we used to beat the crap out of each other, you know, and, and, and uh, we, knew how, we knew how to work. And, and you know, we, we told a good story and we brought the fans in, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, that's one thing I learned from the honky tonk. You know, the honky tonk man told me is is the fans come to a show because they want to be part of that show. So you got to make them part of that show, and 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 you know you you got to know how to make them part of part of the show. You know, bring them into the ring. Was there was there anyone back in your career that you would have liked to work worked with that you never got a chance? Uh, well. Uh, I would have liked to have worked against Dick Murdoch as a heel. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I, I worked with for him a little bit, he was a baby face when him and uh, Blackjack Mulligan bought the Texas territory from the Funks. Uh, so I didn't get, I never got to work with him, but I, 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 I thought he was a great heel and a great worker, and it would have been fun to work with him. Absolutely. All right. One well, more, hey, let I me ask one more question. Let, yeah, let me ask one more that. question, Mike. Hey, um, before we let you go, um, with all your history in wrestling, do you collect anything yourself? Um, do you? Is there any wrestling memorabilia that you have, or do you collect your own trading cards? Anything like that? I'm just curious. I, I don't collect anything. I, I I have my own, you know, that I that I bring to arenas and. And you know, and 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 sell to to, to the fans and, and, and autograph them. Uh, I have uh, probably maybe ten figures in my house of me, but I don't collect anything from anybody else. Gotcha. Uh, you know, it, it would have been nice. Uh, I used to see uh, Jimmy Hart. I mean, he, that guy collected all kinds of stuff yeah. way back. Yeah. So the stuff that he must have must be unbelievable. I mean, he—he, he, uh, I remember him seeing seeing him with uh, sheets of of cards, mm -hmm. you know, from the you know the sheets. I didn't even know they made the sold them in sheets, and he had the sheets, you know, and wherever we went, he co he collected the programs, and I mean, man, he had a. I never, I if if I would have collected all that stuff, I'd be a very very wealthy man right now. You know? <laughs> yeah. And if you would have kept that belt, <laughs> you know, yeah. Kept that belt, yeah. Oh well, you know, this was fantastic. This is like a dream come true to me because, like. I loved you when I was a kid, even though I was a magnificent Morocco fan. I apologize in, <laughs> in hindsight for that. But uh, this is just like a dream come true. Like, thank you well, so much for joining us. Magnificent Morocco to me, you know, I learned the most uh, working with him the short time that I worked with him. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, my interviews improved tremendously because we used to, when you're involved in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a feud, it's almost like a shoot. You know, you 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 your interviews is like if you were having a real fight with a, with another human being. Yeah. And what you would say to, to the guy if he had done something to you or if he treated you, you know, and and uh, that's how we learn how to speak from our heart. You know, we we didn't have to to, to memorize what we were going to say; mm -hmm. it would just come out. You know, the feeling, and, and that's how the the fans would would feel that you know and you know Roddy Piper and the, there wasn't too many guys who, who couldn't talk you know we we all we all expressed our, our ourselves uh, like if it was a real thing you know 
It was fantastic. And like I said, we'll let you get going, but I really do appreciate you joining us. Uh, are you making any appearances? Do you have anything you'd like to promote? Well, uh, I just like to promote. I'm, I'm, I still, uh, I had a book come out, uh, Don't Call Me Chico. Uh, <laughs> that I, I, I uh, just I got the name from, uh, and Kenny, Kenny Casanova got the name from uh, Jesse the Body. Yeah, <clears> throat> throat> if, you, <clears throat> if you talk to Jesse, uh, they asked Jesse who, who would be the number one guy that he would want to wrestle. He, he always says uh, Tito Santana. Because we used to have some great matches. I mean, uh, I was a good baby face. He was a great heel. We'd have a match, and we wouldn't even touch for ten minutes, and the people would re be ready to come <laughs> in the ring and, and and you know jump on Jesse because you know he he was he he just knew how to get uh, the fans uh, uh, he oh bothered you know and yeah um, he was a great heel. He was great. Okay, Anthony, well, you have anything else? I, I was just gonna say it was great having you on. Um, very appreciative. Thank you for taking the time to uh, visit with us. Make sure you give those two guys that you're with a hard time the next couple days. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Take Thank care, you guys. for everything. Take care. Arriba. Right. <laughs>